Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> exactly 50 years ago, in 1972, President Nixon went to China. I was not alive then, but as I understand it, many followed his visit on television with excitement and some trepidation. And of course, it's undeniable that Nixon's trip has had immeasurable consequences for our international relations ever since. Much of what I know about that visit is from one of my favorite operas, Nixon in China by the Bay Area's own John Adams. If you haven't seen or heard it, I strongly recommend that you do. And an interesting Episcopalian connection is that the librettist of that opera, the poet Alice Goodman, who went to Harvard College with Adams, later moved to England, converted to Christianity, and is now an Anglican priest. An early and memorable line from that opera of hers has the president sitting on Air Force One, at that time a Boeing 707, preparing to land in Beijing. Nixon says to himself, we live in an unsettled time. Who are our enemies? Who are our friends? And 50 years later, those words feel just as poignant and relevant as ever, even as we celebrated our nation's independence this past Monday. Today's lesson from the book of the prophet Amos tells a story from nearly 2,800 years ago. Amos, who was born in the southern kingdom of Judah, traveled to the northern kingdom of Israel, where he experienced five visions in which surprisingly commonplace images are transformed into cataclysmic harbingers of doom upon Israel, its king, and its religious authorities. Today's vision, the simple plumb line, is somehow spun into a prediction of death and exile. And spoiler alert, next Sunday's reading takes the picture of a simple basket of fruit and uses that to forecast even greater national destruction. It might sound far-fetched to our modern ears, but as Christians, we are familiar with the transformation of simple images from secular use into sacred significance. A wooden cross was used to execute the Son of God and has found symbolic meaning ever since. Through water, we are baptized and our sins forgiven. And here at this altar in this service, our bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. So maybe a plumb line and a fruit bowl aren't quite as crazy as they sound. Everything we know about the prophet Amos is from the book that bears his name. So, as we heard in the reading, we understand that he's a farmer who was scandalized by the injustices of King Jeroboam, so scandalized he traveled all the way to Bethel in the heart of the northern kingdom to prophesy against them. Amaziah tried to give him an out, asking him to go back to Judah, to which Amos doubles down with this dramatic, and to my ears at least, very cruel set of words promising death and destruction in the harshest possible terms. It might be heretical to say this here, but if I'd been living back then, I'm not sure I'd have liked Amos very much. <laughs> As Nixon says, who are our enemies? Who are our friends? Or indeed, in the words of the comedian Joey Adams, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Our gospel reading today, of course, is far, far better known than the prophet Amos. It is perhaps even the best known of all of Jesus' parables. It's given its name to legislation, so-called Good Samaritan laws, to nonprofits, even to churches and to hospitals. In this case, there really is no question who is your enemy and who is your friend. The message is crystal clear. Samaritan, good. Priest or Levite, bad. <laughs> but of course, it's never quite that easy. I often think of this parable as I cross the street to avoid somebody I don't want to talk to, or when I keep a wide berth from somebody on the sidewalk when I'm embarrassed to engage with them. 
basically whenever I literally do exactly the opposite of what Jesus tells me to do. Of course, I always have my excuses, we all do. I'm in a hurry, or I'm with my kids, or I'm just not in the mood. But in my heart, I know I could do better, and occasionally I try to. In Amos' harsh words, we essentially learn that it's too late for King Jeroboam and his court. Their time has come, and their downfall is apparently prescribed. However, in the words of that wonderful hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, we know that through Christ there is plentiful redemption. That no matter how much we fail, we have that much opportunity to do better and to grow in faith and love and service. So what can we learn from the ministry of Amos and the ministry of the Good Samaritan? Well, they have three things in common. First, they are both foreigners, political and religious outsiders. Second, they are a people of modest social status, a Samaritan, and Amos, a Judean farmer. Third, they are fearless in doing what they believe is right, no matter at what personal risk or political cost, representing truth to power, not just in their words, but much more so in their actions. Now, whatever you may think of President Nixon, and I suspect I have a pretty good idea about some of you, he too traveled to a foreign land with a difficult yet timely message, genuinely unsure of how he and it would be received. And that ambiguity endured for years after the visit itself. It took seven more years for the United States to normalize diplomatic relations with China, and it seems like we're still figuring them out even today. Nixon may not have been a prophet, but there are some undeniable similarities. Prophetic voices are not generally popular, often upend the status quo, and don't always create immediate results. The fourth century St. Gregory of Nyssa, in his Life of Moses, stated, we consider becoming God's friend the only thing worthy of honor and desire. Again, we consider becoming God's friend the only thing worthy of honor and desire. And from today's readings, we see that we are called in word and deed to follow that path, difficult as it may be. For while Amos was certainly a political figure, his motive was certainly not political, but rather his love of God and his desire to be God's friend. And of course, the character of the Good Samaritan is used by Jesus himself to show us exactly what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. This leads me to ask the question, who are the prophetic voices of our own time? I invite you to think again about the commonalities I described earlier. An outsider of modest social status who speaks and acts to show truth to power. Where do we find such prophets in our own day, I wonder? We all probably have our own answers, and I encourage you to ponder more about that in the days ahead. At the same time, we can acknowledge with gratitude that in Christ we are friends and not enemies. Indeed, in the words of another beloved hymn, we are no more a stranger nor a guest, but like a child at home. In that spirit, I encourage you to open your hearts, to love your neighbor, and to listen to the voices of the prophets in our midst. My colleague, Ana Hernandez, wrote a beautiful chant that sets this simple prayer, open my heart. I invite you to join me now in singing it together. Open my heart, 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 open my heart. Open my heart.
heart, open my 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 heart. my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart, open my heart.